Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-decision episode of SCOTUScast, Alien Bond Hearings and Mandatory Detention Edition. I'm your host, Grace Gotchling. On March 19, 2019, the Supreme Court decided Nielsen v. Priap and its companion case, Wilcox v. Corey, both of which consider the extent to which the mandatory detention provision of the Immigration and Naturalization Act applies to defendants who were not arrested by immigration officials immediately upon their release from criminal custody. Aliens who are arrested in order to be removed from the United States typically can seek release or parole on bond while any dispute about their removability is being resolved. Title VIII of the United States Code, Section 1226C1, however, creates an exception. Aliens who have committed certain crimes or have a connection to terrorism must be arrested when released from custody relating to their criminal charges, and almost always held without bond until the question of removal is settled. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit interpreted this mandatory detention provision to apply only when the alien is arrested immediately after release from prison. If a short period of time intervenes, the court concluded, the alien must be allowed the chance to apply for release on bond or parole. By a vote of 5-4, the Supreme Court reversed the Ninth Circuit's judgment and remanded the case. Respondent aliens who fall within the scope of Section 1226C1, the court held, can be detained even if federal officials did not arrest them immediately upon release. Justice Alito announced the judgment of the court and delivered the opinion of the court with respects to Parts 1, 3A, 3B1, and 4, and an opinion with respects to Parts 2 and 3B2, in which Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh joined. Justice Thomas filed an opinion concurring in part and concurring in the judgment in which Justice Gorsuch joined. Justice Kavanaugh filed a concurring opinion. Justice Breyer filed a dissenting opinion in which Justices Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan joined. And now, to discuss the case, we have Greg Brower, shareholder at Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Trek. So this litigation began back in 2013 when the respondents brought a putative class action in the Northern District of California. The lead plaintiff, Priap, was a lawful permanent resident alien who had been in U.S. criminal custody on drug convictions and was released from custody back in 2006. Pursuant to 8 U.S. Code Section 1226, DHS took him into custody in 2013. The district court certified a class consisting of all aliens in California who, quote, are or will be subjected to mandatory detention under Section 1226C of Title VIII and who were not taken into custody by DHS immediately upon their release from criminal custody. The plaintiffs in the case argued that they were exempt from mandatory detention, that is detention with no bond hearing, under Section 1226C, even though they had committed the predicate offenses, or at least one of the predicate offenses, listed in Section 1226C, because, they argued, the statute's mandatory detention provision does not apply unless DHS takes the alien into custody immediately after release from criminal custody. The district court in the case did in fact enter a preliminary injunction in favor of the respondents, agreeing with their reading of section 1226C and ordered that the government provide bond hearings to all class members. The Ninth Circuit then affirmed despite acknowledging that four other circuits had sided with the government's position that a gap in custody, that is a gap between the underlying criminal custody and DHS custody, is irrelevant under Section 1226C. Again, four other circuits 
had decided previously that such a gap would be Ill, is irrelevant under the statute. The Supreme Court eventually granted cert, and as I said, this wasn't necessarily a high-profile case, but it did draw several amicus briefs, including an excellent one by my friends at the Washington Legal Foundation, who filed on behalf of several members of Congress. The government argued in front of the Supreme Court that Section 1226C clearly provides that a detained criminal alien is subject to mandatory detention, that is, without bond, regardless of whether DHS takes him into custody immediately upon release from criminal custody or at some later time. The government further argued that beyond the plain language and meaning of the statute, the context and purpose of the statute reinforces the point that detention is mandatory regardless of the timing of the detention, pointing to the Supreme Court's decision from 2003 in a case called Demore versus Kim, in which the court referenced Congress's concern that deportable criminal aliens who are not detained will in many cases fail to appear for their removal hearings. And, and thus that, that was the, the policy position behind the statutory language. The third point argued by the government was that the Ninth Circuit's interpretation would create, would create practical problems for DHS because DHS cannot always be ready to immediately take every criminal alien into custody at the very moment that he or she is released from criminal custody, especially in light of the fact that many local jurisdictions around the country are increasingly not cooperating with DHS in that regard. Moreover, the government argued that if Congress had wanted to create a, quote, gap in custody, end quote, my quote, exception to a no-bond mandatory detention process, it could have done so in the statute, but clearly did not. The respondent's argument centered around what I will call a convoluted analysis of the language and the grammar of Section 1226C. And this is what I alluded to earlier as it appeared to be an attempt by the dissenters to complicate a relatively simple statute in order to achieve, in their view, a more just result. But their argument centered on the, the grammar and the language, focusing on the, the following language, quote, when the alien is released, end quote, part of the statute. And they argued that the language, that that language must be read as immediately when the alien is released, despite the fact that the word immediately is not found anywhere in the statute, nor is there any other reference in the language of the statute to a time element that the government must meet in order to effectuate a, a no-bond detention. The respondents further argued that a criminal alien could be taken into custody at a later date, but only subject to a bond hearing. Predictably, respondents also maintained that congressional intent supported their interpretation what the respondents argue that Congress's concern was, was that removable aliens coming out of criminal custody should not be picked up, should not be detained if there was some gap period between the criminal custody and the DHS detention. At bottom, the respondents' argument was really, it seems to me, based on their position that detention without a bond hearing is simply an unfair violation of due process even in the civil context. The case was argued before the Supreme Court on October 10th. It was decided on March 19th, with Justice Alito writing for a five to four majority. Justice Alito first explained Section 1226C by clarifying that most aliens detained by DHS are able to seek review of their detention in the form of a bond hearing with the exception being provided by the statute for several specific types of aliens for whom detention is mandatory because of the nature of their offense. It was undisputed in this case that the respondents were aliens of the type 
that are subject to mandatory, that is, no bond detention, leaving the only issue in the case, the question of whether the timing of DHS's detention was relevant. Now, there were some preliminary jurisdiction issues argued in the case as well. I'm not going to address those at this point. They, they were uh, simply just irrelevant to the main point of the case. Justice Alito disagreed with the respondent's position as he, as he put it, he disagreed with the position as, quote, running aground on the plain text of the statute, finding that it was the plain text, that the text was so plain that respondent's argument was simply illogical and nonsensical. He then ran through each of the respondent's sort of convoluted grammar based arguments about why the statute, how the statute should be read and dismissed each of them. Again, finding that the plain, simple reading of the statute included no temporal element and thus allowed for DHS to detain without bond even if the DHS arrest occurred some even significant time after the alien's release from criminal custody. Justices Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and the Chief Justice joined in Justice Alito's opinion. Interestingly, Justice Kavanaugh wrote a concurring opinion to emphasize that he saw this case as presenting a sole, narrow question, that is, whether detention under the statute is mandatory, even if not affected immediately upon the release of criminal custody. And he didn't see the case as being any more complicated than that. Finding that the language of the statute was clear He simply found it easy to reverse the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision without getting into an exhaustive discussion of the language and the grammar and various canons of interpretation that both the majority opinion and the dissent spent a lot of time on. Justice Thomas was joined by Justice Gorsuch in writing another concurrence that dealt into the jurisdictional issues that I mentioned, and I won't won't delve into those today. On the other side, Justice Breyer wrote the dissent joined by Justices Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan. The dissent focused on the, as I read it, really focused uh, on the unfairness, the perceived unfairness of no bond detention for aliens who are not immediately detained upon release from criminal custody. Uh, the, The dissent focused a lot on the familial and community connection realities that might exist for someone who has been living in the United States for a relatively long period of time between release from criminal custody and being picked up by DHS. Uh, The dissent uh, also, as I mentioned, delved into the same grammar exercise undertaken by Justice Alito Uh, but goes even deeper, and I would submit makes the issue even more confusing, but clearly not convincing to the majority. I suspect, as I'm sure many of you do, that Justice Alito decided to go into the grammar issues because that was clearly an issue for the likely dissenters, and he wanted to sort of shore up and preempt that argument in his own majority opinion. So the the bottom line, as I see it from, from the decision is that the majority believed that the statute was clear, and indeed, as I mentioned, Justice Kavanaugh thought it was even more than clear and and likely would have written, if he were writing the majority opinion, a very, very short, terse, concise opinion. I guess another just obvious takeaway from the decision, as I read it, is this was not a constitutional challenge, and as a result, Congress could simply change Section 1226, and presumably include a temporal element that would necessitate a bond hearing for those detainees who are not arrested uh, immediately upon or within five days or ten days or whatever Congress would, would want to do from their release from criminal custody. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUS Cast. SCOTUS Cast is a project of the Federalist Society a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, 
and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production.